I want to preach today from this subject, the riches of being poor in spirit. The riches of being poor in spirit. Bless us now, Lord, as we minister the word of the Lord. God, may we leave here today poor in spirit. Mm. Poverty of soul. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The blessings of being poor in spirit or the riches of being poor in spirit. Let me begin by saying that our text does not refer to going to heaven someday. When the Lord says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's not speaking of the kingdom of heaven in heaven where God the Father uh, is and where Jesus is now and where our departed loved ones are and where we will be when the Lord comes for us in the rapture and take us to heaven. And the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Oh, what a promise we have. We, uh, we Yes, I believe in heaven. There is a literal Heaven, we're saved to someday go to heavens. I even know where heaven is. Praise Lord. Heaven is wherever God is. Wherever God is right now, that place is heaven. And he's going to take us to heaven. And in heaven, there will be no sickness. In heaven, there would be no sin. Can you imagine living in a place where there will be no evil to resist? So there's nothing on earth, really, that can almost compare us to, to going to heaven. Uh, ever since we met Jesus, we've had to contend with the devil and, and, and the sin nature. None of those things will be in heaven. Praise the Lord. The streets of heaven will be uh, made of gold. And there will be an a, a emerald rainbow in heaven that will be over the throne of God. And we will get to see God the Father as he is. Uh, no man have seen God the Father at any time because no human being can look on God and live. So therefore, God gives various manifestations of himself. Moses wanted to see him, and the Lord told Moses, you can't, you can't see me, because if you look at me, you're going to die. So God the Father blinds Moses. He puts his hands before Moses and walks past Moses and says, now you can see my back. Amen. But the day will come that we will see him, the, the scripture says, Third John, uh, 1 John chapter 3, that we will see him as, we, as he is. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. And the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. But we know that when we see him, uh, we shall be like him and we shall see him. As he is. What a promise. The Bible says every man who has the hope to see Jesus as he is doth purify himself even as Christ is pure. We are living to live again. Job said there where the wicked shall cease from troubling. There is a place that God has for the believers. Amen. We're going to heaven someday and when we're in heaven we will sit down at the table and we will dine with Abraham Isaac and Jacob 
we will see Jesus himself. We will see the 20 and four elders in heaven. We will see the four beasts who constantly take off their golden crowns and throw them at Jesus' feet and they sing hallelujah praises to him. This goes on 24 seven in heaven. There's a tree in heaven by the river that flows with crystal clear water that comes from the throne of God in heaven. We'll be able to walk up to that tree and eat from the tree. And the Bible says all, no tear ducts will, will, will work, no Kleenex in heaven. There'll be no crying for God himself shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes in heaven. Isn't that something to look forward to? Woo! Glo glory to God. Heaven is so wonderful that Paul says, if in this life we have hope in Christ only, we are above all men most miserable. Heaven! Amen. There's a whole lot of things that I would do that I won't do because I want to go to heaven. My pastor used to tell us that you got to love your neighbor just enough to get to heaven. That's a whole lot of loving. I'm not going to let you cause me to uh, uh, hate you and be mad at you and, 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 and resent you. And every time your name is called, I get vexed and let you keep me out of heaven. Then you get right and you end up in heaven and me and my resentment self go to hell and there you are in heaven. Elder Turner is in heaven. Can't wait to talk to him. Bishop Mason is in heaven. God Almighty. Moses is in heaven. I have loved ones in heaven. Praise the Lord. I have church mothers, Mother Johnson, and some of our mothers call the roll, uh, even from here. Mother, these mothers are in heaven. We have some fathers in heaven. I wonder if Deacon Clarence Morgan is up there in heaven lifting weights. So he used to go to his house. Now him and his brother, Elder Joe Morgan, now the chairman of our elders council, Joe is Slim, uh, Clarence uh, Morgan had, a, had, the, had, the, had the muscles to go to his house and lift with him. And uh, he's in heaven now. I wonder if he's in heaven bench pressing anything. I don't know if they have bench presses or not. Scriptures doesn't say, but I know he's up there with the Lord. And I, I tell you what, I plan to go and see for myself. And when I get to heaven, I'm not going to be up there talking about how I'm going to tell him all about my troubles. And, Tell him how I made it over and tell him, no, no, no. When I get up there, I'm, I'm going to look around, see if God's here, my cousin. I'm going to look around and say, whoa, I made it. Thank you. And, and the, first, uh, the first thing I'm going to say, probably the second thing would be, you know, I, th th this was worth it, you know. We didn't suffer anything. Because see, when you consider what the Lord has waiting for us, to what we go through down here, this, this go through stuff is overrated. Overrated. Just one moment in God's kingdom will pay for it all. You won't have to worry about sunscreen in heaven. You won't see the airplanes flying over here leaving all them chemicals, them long trails all up in the sky. You don't have to worry about that when you get to heaven because no sunspots, no skin cancer, none of that because Christ himself will be the light. He's going to light up heaven himself. Now that's, that's, that's just something. And as wonderful as heaven is up there, Paul called it the third heaven. There is heaven number one, the sky that we see. 
Heaven number two, the universe. Heaven number three, where God is. Someday we're going to the third heaven. When I get caught up in the rapture, I'm going to go past the first, through the second, into the third. Amen. And uh, I'm not worried about wings. I got two wings, and that's good singing and all that. If these two wings fail me, give me another pair. No, the Lord's going, <laughs> he's going to rapture us up. He's going to get us up. Amen. And uh, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the middle of the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I want to go to heaven. But as wonderful as heaven is, that's not what the Lord was referencing in our text. What he was referencing in our text is found in chapter 4 and verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What was he talking about? He's talking about something that's totally different from what the law of Moses offered. Something that is superior to the sacrifice of bulls and goats and rams, something that is superior to any state of bliss that Judaism could give. It's so superior that when one man heard about it, he came to talk to Jesus by night. The Bible says, John's Gospel, chapter 3, says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, who came to Jesus by night, came by caution, didn't want the crowd to know that he was curious about this new thing that had taken place. There's John the Baptist have set the world on fire, baptizing people, talking about a kingdom that's coming, a new move of God coming. And then John identified Jesus as the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Jesus having worked a miracle in Canaan and, and uh and turned water into wine and has already by now made his first trip into the temple and turned over the tables of the money changers and had caused a ruckus. Bible teaches in John's gospel, chapter two, it says, now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover uh, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. Jesus didn't trust their superficial faith because he knew that they were excited about, praise the Lord, the miracles. And uh, this, uh, you know, everybody who joins a movement aren't really with it. And notice this, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew who he was. He did not need man's testimony about himself, because he knew that he was who he, the Son of God. For he knew what was in man. So he knew their hearts. So there's, there's, there's this excitement. There's this buzz. There's this move of God. There's John the Baptist. He's drawing crowds by the thousands. Baptized Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God came down like a dove. God the Father spoke from heaven said, this is my beloved son. And John baptized him. The Holy Ghost came down like a dove and lit on Jesus' shoulders. And now Jesus is preaching the gospel of of the kingdom. He's not preaching a Jew. Now he's a Jew, but he's not preaching Moses. He's not preaching orthodoxy. He's preaching 
something new. Nicodemus being a Pharisee, an expert in the law, an authority in theology. He knew Moses. He knew the prophets. He knew the Talmud. He knew, praise the Lord, the Pentateuch. He knew the teachings back and forth, like the back of his hand. He knew all of the traditions of the elders. But this new thing was not only different from what he knew, but it was superior. And so being an inquisitive man, but being a man of reputation, uh, and uh, being a man who kind of need to be poor of spirit, came to Jesus by night. And said unto him, Rabbi. Rabbi. He was courteous. Isn't that interesting? He courteously called Jesus Rabbi. He was courteous. But he, he, he courteously referred to Jesus. He used a title to refer to our Lord that the Lord didn't use to refer to himself. For the Lord never called himself Rabbi. He said, I'm the Lamb of God. I'm the Son of God. Amen. You bringing me down. Like these preachers call themselves a life coach now. You bringing yourself down. I ain't no coach. I'm a bishop. I'm a pastor. Now that ranks higher in God's order than, than teaching somebody how to play a game. I'm not making fun of the profession. It's, it's necessary, but it won't get you to heaven. What I'm saying to you right now will matter in your life, a hundred thousand years from now. For how you respond to this will, can determine where you spend eternity. I have an important mission. The medical doctor can't make that claim. The psychologist, the secular ones, can't make that claim. Presidents can't make that claim. They just laid to rest. Former first lady, Barbara Bush. I hope she was saved like the Bible says. Because there's nothing in politics that can help her now. He came to Jesus by night. He was courteous. And he says, Rabbi, I guess he was speaking for others. We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles except that thou doest, except God be with him. It's interesting, his choice of words. I won't dissect too much, but I won't be too uh, didactic today. We've been in the workers' meeting, and you all are tired, and you want a quick summer. See, some of you didn't already, you, see, some of you getting sleepy too early. So, see, I, I'm just getting started. You see, if you're fighting already to keep you out, so. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad I'm not easily, you know, insulted in my feelings. You know, I'd feel bad. I said, but well, maybe I'm not a good preacher. As soon as I take my text, <laughs> that's bad, isn't it? Amen. But isn't it amazing that he talks to him? says, you are a teacher come from God, and, but no man can do these miracles. The teachings have to do with doctrines. Miracles are phenomenons, are acts. See, the thing that intrigued uh, Nicodemus was the teachings of Jesus accompanied with power. See, but they haven't seen anything the world hadn't seen anybody like Jesus Christ. Amen. Hadn't seen anyone like him before and hadn't seen anyone like him since. My God today. And, uh, and Jesus answered and said unto him, because the Lord realized that Nicodemus is talking good, but he don't know what he's talking about. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't get 
what I've come to bring you. You can't understand what I'm talking about unless you're willing to be born again. Unless you're willing to humble yourself. So you think you, you're able to uh, uh, begin a conversation with me about this new thing that I've come preaching. But you can't see it. You can't get it. You sinners in here, I'm, I hope you're enjoying the service, but don't be too critical. Don't, don't, don't come to conclusions yet because you can't understand this until you get born in this. See, this is not the club. This is not the world. Praise Lord. This is not sports center. This is not what you're accustomed to. You are hearing, you're in the midst of kingdom airs. The atmosphere is filled with the power of the God of the Bible. Praise the Lord. This, this is church. And, and Jesus is moving. And, uh, and I'm not criticizing you. I didn't understand it either. Sitting there looking and somebody break out and go to shouting. I'm going, what? Someone else starts speaking in tongues. Oh my Lord, is that person crazy? Then a power broke out that I could not put into words. So overwhelming that I wanted to leave. But I heard a voice say, don't go anywhere. And I stayed and I heard the word of God. Next thing you know, I was one of them. I'm at the altar crying out, save me, Lord. And the Lord saved my soul. Then it made sense to me. Then it registered. That's why, why somebody struggles so you ain't let the Lord save you yet. See, once the, when the Lord saves you, it makes sense to you. See, some people, it's just so hard for them to figure out they hadn't been saved yet. It's just difficult. I just, Pastor, I try. Just, just seem like to me, I just can't get it. I just have so many questions. I just, I just can't figure it out. You need to be saved. You need, you, you can't join in. You got to be born in. Jesus tells Nicodemus, you can't see this. Here you are talking to me, talking about I'm a great teacher. And no, what no man can and can't do, let me, we, this, is, this won't be a long conversation. Except the man is born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus proves that he was actually as unlearned in the kingdom as Jesus said he was by his next comment. And Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? That tells you right there. That judge, he was as, as in the dark as Jesus uh, rightly uh, discerned because the Lord wasn't talking about a new human birth. And Nicodemus here was not trying to be funny. It was a sincere inquiry. How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter? Now he goes to a little sarcasm. Can he enter uh, into his mother's womb a second time and then be born? And then our Lord answers and says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of uh, the water. A reference to John's baptism and of the spirit that is out of the power of God. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. For that which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And you got to be born of the spirit to understand spiritual truths. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. Amen. Jesus came preaching the kingdom, the kingdom of God, it's called Bezalia. It is that spiritual kingdom that the Lord erects in the heart of each person who gives their heart to Jesus Christ. There's a spiritual kingdom that the Lord be 
reveals in you when you give your heart to him. The Lord, we, 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 we refer to it this way, the Lord came in. The Lord moved in. Something happened to me. That's what happens when you accept the Lord. Are you with me? Our text is not referring to heaven, but it's referring to the blessedness that the believers can have, please hear me for a few minutes, in this life. See, we're serving the Lord to go to heaven, but hopefully we won't go to heaven unless the rapture takes place. Hopefully we won't go to heaven anytime soon. So what about the meantime? Because nobody's volunteering to go today. I know that. Just get sick. Some of you, some of you don't even call for the preacher. Call the ambulance. <laughs> call the doctor. Come get me. I thought you were ready to go to heaven. No, no, no. Call them. To get to heaven, you got to die. What about in the meantime? I'm glad that the Lord doesn't just save us and then leave us to ourselves until he comes back to get us to go to heaven. That is a reality in serving the Lord. The first thing that our Lord does is he speaks or to or teach his disciples of a condition of blessedness. He says, Blessed in our text uh, are the pure of spirit. And actually the word are, if you look at your Bible there, it's italicized, which meant it was added by the translators to give clarity. Actually, it is not instructive here. It is a declaration. If you take R out, the Lord is saying, blessed the poor in spirit. See, it is a declaration of a condition that those who are poor of spirit are in. Blessed, he declares, the poor of spirit. Poor of spirit puts you in a place that every one of us want to enter into, and that place is called a state of blessedness. Blessedness is a state of, listen to this, permanent joy that is not affected by the ups and downs of this life. It's not that the believer goes through life singing and uh, singing in the rain and dancing all the time, but there is a joy. There is a sense of well-being. So I want you to hear me today. That, 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 that is, praise the Lord, a flame that the Lord put, places in the heart of the believer. This is why you know you're in trouble if as a believer, you, 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 your believers, I, 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 you, you won't like what I'm about to say, but believers don't lose their minds. See, believers don't have to get on mind-altering drugs to handle the vicissitudes of this life. I needed a tranquilizer to, to get through. Let me tranquilize my child. How about before you dope him up? How about praying for that baby? But now you, 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 can't, you can't wait till they're 14, 15, and 20 to start praying. You got to raise them right. Because see, there is something that God gives the believer that keeps the believer from cracking. On a child, if that would have been me, I, I don't know what I would have done. Well, it wasn't you. The Lord allowed it to happen to somebody who could go through because they were in a condition or this state of blessedness. And listen to this. This blessedness is superior to happiness. Happiness, if it can be discovered, is something that is never maintained. It's not a state that is consistent because happiness can be here today and gone tomorrow. Some of you, you married someone and the reason you married them was that they made you happy. Now you want to leave them because they no, no longer make you happy. I mean, 
them making you happy ought to be a part of why you married them, but th that can't be the only reason. I want, I want to be with you from now on because I'm happy with you. That won't maintain. Happiness, the, the root word of happiness is the word hap, which deals with circumstances. Favorable circumstances. I can't get a witness. Praise the Lord. It refers to chance. Time and chance happens to all. Bible said the fastest man don't always win. Strongest man doesn't always pre uh, prevail. The best team don't always win the Super Bowl like the last one. But time and chance. <laughs> Showing my biases now. Praise the Lord. You all know Tom Brady was the man. But time and chance. <laughs> happens to everybody. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. The Constitution uh, uh, it says in America that it gives us the pursuit of life. It is the, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, one writer expounded on the word happiness there. It wasn't, the, the founders didn't have in mind euphoria. When they said pursuit of happiness, one writer said what they actually had in mind was to own property, build a house, raise a family, earn a living. And with all of the ups and downs and trials and tragedy, uh, tragedies and all of the tough uh, times, the good times, the, the times when the kids get it right, times when they get it wrong, times when mom and dad's doing good, times when mom and dad are arguing, times when the weather's good, times when the weather's bad, times when the child make all A's, times when the child gets suspended. All that is called the pursuit of happiness. Chance may make you happy but it will never make you blessed. The Lord has something greater to offer. See, only God can put you in a state of blessedness. As Christians, we do not depend on chance, but we depend on providence. We depend on the providence of God. God's ability to provide. God's providence, providence of God, the ability to provide in advance. We believe that our God will make a way for us. This blessedness it was a quality attributed to the ancient Greeks, to the gods, small G-O-D. They use the, the Greek word for blessedness, uh, makaritos, and I won't just, I won't throw out many words because I don't want you trying to remember a word as much as to get what I'm saying. Uh, they, 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 uh, when the Greeks in, in their false mythology talked about the gods, they, 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 they imagined these gods that didn't exist, but, you know, except in their own minds, uh, to be in this state of blessedness where everything went their way and they were just happy all the time. The gospel writers used, used this same Greek word to convey Christ's teachings about the inward condition of the soul of man when Christ becomes his Lord. The gospel writers took a word that the, that the Greeks used to describe their mythological gods and say, well, the Lord can actually do this in your soul. So this is why, this is why you know, I, I, you know I, in studying and understanding certain things, that's why I talk so much and uh, about the direction sometimes that the church go in. We, we, we're, too, we're too quick to be sad. So we're going the wrong way. Amen. We're not displaying enough joy. We're buying into concepts, sounds, and things that rob us of our joy. Most of the stuff, JT, most of these songs and these new worship styles put us to sleep. Rob us of our hand clapping, foot stomping. Shouting and dancing, we're becoming professional mourners. Winding our way through life. No, no. The joy of the Lord is your strength. 
Yes, sir. They, they, took this, they took this term and said, no, no, no. The Lord actually does this. This blessedness was used to express the joy and happiness experienced uh, back in the day. It was used to describe the, the, the joy and happiness, listen to this, that was experienced uh, by the dead. People would look at the dead and see the look of serenity on their faces and you on the face of the dead. And people do it now. Man's dead, liar, killer, thief. thief. You look at him. You know, Martician did a great job. And you look at him. He's laying there. Look like he's in such peace. And a, a, a rapist. He's in a better place. Oh, so serene, you know. Oh, just, just, oh, look at him. I can just see it on him. They got that light, see, it's the games. They know how to position that light in the casket, shine in a certain way. Praise the Lord. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's art. I'm not making fun of it. And, you know, all of us have suffered the death of loved ones. And for some who've suffered the death of loved ones recently, pardon me for not being showing proper sensitivity, but you know, your loved one was saved, but I'm, I'm saying it's an art. It's called mortuary science. They cater to what you can see. That's what it's designed to do. The, the, the casket looks like the most comfortable box on earth. It is not. But there are portions of it that appears to be, it's, it's for, it's not for the dead, it's for the survivors. The family is to, to provide comfort. So I'm not making fun of it, but I'm, I'm trying to show you how this word blessedness was used. It's, it's used to create a, a, frame of, a, a frame of thought. So it's designed. I, I, I've, I've been with my, the late uh, Elder Everett Williams was my dear friend. And among other things, he was a mortician. So I, I got a chance to see mortuary the science on, on a level that most people don't. Go back there, and I remember the first time they took me back uh, with someone. The guy was, uh, the guy was, uh, he was stealing, and uh, he, he, he robbed the store. I'm not gonna call his name. And he was running out the store, and as getting away with the product, he was running out the store, and, and the tractor trailer hit him. That was a bad day to steal, wasn't it? And so, uh, he, he, obviously, he got killed. And so I'm back there. Uh, he didn't just die. The tractor trailer hit him. So, you know, uh, and so, and they hadn't fixed him up yet. And left me in the room by myself. <laughs> and this was my first time. And I'm, I'm just telling you. And I, I you know, so I, I looked at him and I said, don't you move. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Had that been a breeze in there and the breeze would have blown his hair, ooh, I wouldn't be here preaching to you today. <laughs> but a good mortician can take the remains and when he's finished with those remains and he opens the casket to serve the family, a good one, if they know what they're doing, he appears to be lying there in a state of blessedness. Jesus takes this state that the mortician can simulate and that the Greeks referred to false gods and said, I will actually do this in your heart. It'll be real in your life if you accept me. Here Jesus is saying that we don't have to wait until we die to experience the fullness of God. Who wants the fullness of God? Who wants to walk in a state of blessedness? Jesus says, I have this for you. Amen. The Greeks also use this word blessedness uh, to describe someone or something that is self-sufficient. Doesn't need any help. Complete in and of itself. But as believers, we're not self-sufficient. 
The gospel doesn't use it to describe self-sufficiency, but it does use, it's used to describe the fact that once we accept the Lord, we become God-sufficient. I'm on my way somewhere. Are you following me? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 uh, through uh, 6 says, Ye are our epistles, written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared, speaking to the Corinthians, to be the epistles of Christ. Many of us are the only Bible that people will read ministered by us. Keep that in mind. We are the only Bible that many people see and read. This is why we got to live a certain way. Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone and not on fleshly tables, uh, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Not written on stone, a reference to the Ten Commandments, but written in our hearts. That is the word of God indelibly written on the inside. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. That is, and such trust have we uh, through Christ uh, in the presence of God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves but our sufficiency is of God. The way to walk in blessedness is to become God sufficient. But one of the reasons why we got to become poor of soul is that there's a tendency for me to be self-sufficient. I depend more on Patrick then I depend on Jesus. You depend more on yourself than the Lord. And the Lord is saying, as I get to it, that we got to empty out. Yeah. One of the reasons we're not as happy as we ought to be is that we're too full of ourselves. Can I get a witness? Verse 6 says, Who have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter for the letter, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth. That is the law brought condemnation. But the spirit giveth life. Jesus Christ came to set us free. And to give us life. To experience this state or condition of blessedness. Are you following me? One must first be number one. The first of the Beatitudes. Be poor of Spirit. Somebody shout, poor, poor of spirit. Now, let's unpack poor of spirit. And Rocky, get on the organ and we're going to go home in just a few minutes. Amen. He says, blessed the poor in spirit. Our Lord is saying that the natural and inescapable outcome of being in a state of blessedness is poverty of spirit. Now there are two Greek words for the word poor. One of the words uh, represents the working poor. Everybody say working poor. The working poor are those who are poor. They are laborers who work hard, but they have to work hard to satisfy their poverty. They earn just enough to be able to eat. The working poor do not build, in most cases, a bank account. The working poor can't miss a day. This is what, this one, this is what he's describing. The working poor uh, has to work until he has satisfied uh, his poverty for that day. The Bible says in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if a man would not work, neither should he eat. 
the working poor, they're not the poor in extreme poverty. Uh, it is not extreme want, but it is the opposite of the rich who needs not to work to satisfy his needs. Amen. There are some people who are so well off that if they don't go to work today, this month, nor next, it won't affect their standard of living. These aren't the people that this word poor is talking about. This, this working poor, as I forestated, have to work. All right? That is uh, the poor. This working poor, though, is not the poor that our Lord is speaking of when he says pure, poor, excuse me, of soul. Are you with me? Here's the key. It is the poor who is not, on, is not able to meet his own needs. It's the poor who depend on the arms and the goodness of others. When the Lord said poor spirit, he's talking about uh, in terms of the spirit being a beggar. If you are working poor, you're not poor enough. You have to be poor of spirit now. So poor, so poor that you need someone else. You need, you need charity. Luke's gospel describes this kind of poverty. In Luke 16 and 20 through 21, uh, it says, And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the rich man's gate. Lazarus, not only was he a beggar, but he was sick. He was full of sores. And look at this, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. As an act of kindness, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. This is extreme poverty. God, God Almighty. According to Plato, it is the man who is in such poverty that he has to couch or crouch in the presence of his superiors. There are some people who are so poor that they're too poor to stand up straight. That's psychological. You know, so poor that he doesn't feel like a man. Can't stick his chest out for he has nothing going for him. So in all company, they just bow. They cower because they are that poor. You, I know some of you say, well, I wouldn't do that. That's because you've never been that poor. And thank God that you haven't. But for people who have, they know what I'm talking about. Poverty, extreme poverty changes your swagger. Number one, it robs it. You can't have a swagger and, and experience extreme poverty. Poverty. Praise the Lord. You, you, can, you, can, you can have swagger and be a part of the working poor. But if you are in extreme poverty and you depend on uh, the uh, arms of other people, your poverty uh, causes you to have to humble yourself. Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. The, this extreme poor, he is empty. He is poor. He is helpless. This is the kind of poor that is necessary to enter into our Lord's state of blessedness. Oh, you're not with me. Our Lord is saying that unless a man realizes his poverty, his realize his complete emptiness, and his inability to fill the void, he will never be filled. See, some of us, when we've come to Jesus, some of us have come to Jesus feeling like I have something to offer Jesus. Some of us have come to Jesus feeling like Jesus needs our story. Some of us have come to Jesus feeling like Jesus needs our voice. You're not poor enough yet. In order to really get Jesus, 
You got to realize that you have nothing that Jesus needs. Oh, if I get saved and bring Jesus my education, then Jesus can use me. Like that song Mary Mary said that uh, Jesus looked at them and, and saw something that he could use. That's not poverty of spirit. If you feel like you got something that Jesus can use, you're not poor enough in your thinking. And it will affect your relationship with him. Well, I'm good looking. The Lord can use my looks. You're not poor enough. I'm fast. I'm, a, I'm an athlete. I'm rich. I have money. You're not poor enough. In order to uh, enter into this state, you've got to be where, got to get to the point where we see just how ugly and how filthy and how empty we actually are and that we need him and that he doesn't need us it is you when when you are in poverty of soul you can't make a bargain with god for you have nothing to bargain with amen amen some of us we bargain with god well i the church needs me and the kingdom needs me i remember on television one day uh the george bloomer show and he and another uh, preacher was talking to carlton uh, pearson and they were telling carlton come back and the, because the body of christ needs you oh i wish i would have been on the show i would have told them stop lying but if Christ doesn't need him, and praise the Lord, we serve a self, all-sufficient God. He doesn't need any of us. He doesn't need me. What would happen to God if I stopped preaching today? Nothing. What would happen to the gospel if I stopped preaching today? Nothing. My God, he'd raise up someone else. Wouldn't, wouldn't skip a beat. Wouldn't skip a beat, praise the Lord. Because you see, he is God. And uh, when we come to him, we've got to humble ourselves. See, Nicodemus, the fact that he came by night, he wasn't poor enough. When you're poverty of soul, you come to Jesus and you don't care who sees you. Preacher, I wanted to get saved, but I was afraid of what my friends would think. You're not poor enough. Because when you really get poor enough, you could care less what your friends think. You just realize that I need to be born again. Mm -hmm. When we, even those of us who are saved, that, that there's another blessing, there's other revelations, there, there's other knowledge and things that God wants to give us. But, but we, we, we're too puffed up. Uh, it's, it's too much about me and, and it's too much about us. And the Lord is saying the things that I want to do for you, I can't do because you, you're in the way. But if you would just get out of the way, if you just, just humble yourself, the Bible said he that exalteth himself shall be humbled. But he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The way up in God is down. And I heard Jesus, he stood up and said one day, he said, if any man will, 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 will follow me, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. And when you deny yourself, that will make you suffer. When you deny yourself, hallelujah, you, you got to deny the cravings of the flesh. You got to deny certain things that you want. You got to deny certain people. When you deny yourself, it creates a discomfort. It creates pain. It creates a longing. When you deny yourself, sometimes it makes you agitated. You go through a stage where you're moody because you're craving what you desire. You go through times when you're up and down. Maybe you get a little short. Good God Almighty, because you are denying yourself. But Jesus said, if you're going to come after me, you got to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. And then I heard him say, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. What are you saying, Jesus? If you come after me 
and try to hang on to your old self. If you come after me, somebody ought to tell the legends and tell Snoop Dogg, if you come after me and try to hang on to the world, good God almighty, you won't get me. You'll miss out. You see, Jesus is calling for true devotion. Jesus is calling for us to empty ourselves of ourselves. If you try to save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. Do you want to know who you really are? Do you want to find your true identity? Do you want to have joy in the midst of sorrow? Do you want to have peace when trouble is all around? Ah! Do you want to be able to go through life's troubles saying, I know my Redeemer lives? Well, you got to lose your life. If you lose your way, Jesus said, you'll find it because I have an identity for you. I have a life for you. I have something for you that's greater than you have for yourself. Young man, come to Jesus. Don't come to him trying to hold on to what you're familiar with. Give it all up. Tell the Lord, here I am. Make me and mold me the way you would have me to be. Ah, young lady, give your heart to Jesus Christ. Let the Lord tell you who you are. Let the Lord give you direction. How many can testify and say he'll give you direction? Won't he give you direction? Won't he show you where to go? Won't he show you where to turn? Won't he show you who to marry? Won't he show you how to live? Won't he visit you in the midnight hour? Won't he take you through the worst of times? Sitting at the funeral and you still discover that there's a joy on the inside. Going through life's troubles, there's still a peace that passes all understanding. I'm glad that he's able, he's able, yeah, yeah. I want to see somebody give God praise if you know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going through, I'm going through. Somebody shout, I'm going through. I'm going through, I'm going through. I'm not stopping in, but I'm going through. I'm not gonna lodge where I am. I'm going through. Why, why am I going through? Because I'm living in a different place. I'm in a state of blessedness. And that state of blessedness lets me know that even though right now my money may be funny and my change may be strange, if I just hold out until tomorrow, if I praise him in the midst of it, if I look to him and say, Lord, Lord, here I am. If I let him, if I let him, I'll discover that while I'm yet going through, there's a joy down in my soul. There's a peace in my mind, and it keeps on telling me that everything will be all right. Yeah. I want you to do something that you're not, uh, that you'll feel funny doing. But if you're today poor in spirit, I want you to rejoice in your poverty because that means you've emptied out. You've gotten rid of all of your 
yourself, your own ways. You're pushing that stuff aside because you want to enter into the kingdom of God. You want it in your heart. You want the joy of it. You want the advantage of being a kingdom heir. It gives you power to overcome the devil. It gives you power to overcome your own shortcomings. All of us have shortcomings, but thank God this bezalia, thank God this blessedness gives us power to rise above it. Do I have anybody here who's been through, but the Lord gave you strength to rise above it. The Lord gave you power to rise above it. And the reason you rose is because you humbled yourself. You got rid of your titles. You got rid of all of the compliments that people were giving you. And you came to the Lord and you said, Lord, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I'm nothing in and of myself. Lord, Somebody rejoice in it. Rejoice in it. Here's how you, here's how you know that, that, that you're not poor enough in your soul. When you're going through and you act like God have done you wrong, you have a s- s- scar on your face, can't praise him, Everybody around you got to act like they're walking on eggshells. All because you're going through. You're not poor enough. You think more highly of yourself than you ought to. You ain't got no bargain with God. I don't know why he let it happen to me. What are you saying? That he should have let, he should have let it happen to someone else? And if you think that, you're not poor enough. I can't get a witness. I can't get a witness. Oh, you, you resent him. You, you constantly feel like, praise the Lord. Oh, let her praise him. You constantly feel like you got to, you overlooked. You overlooked. They ain't giving me enough credit. You ain't poor enough. You're not poor enough. They didn't call my name. Vex for the rest of the night. Not, you're not poor enough. See, when you get poor of spirit, you, 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 you're so poor that you're saying, Lord, I'm just depending on you to let these things happen in your time. So then, then it, 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 doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect you as much. We got to get poor. See, the Lord says, I'll give you the kingdom of heaven on earth. On earth. I'll make you a kingdom heir on earth. I'll do things for you on earth. But in order for you to get this, you got to humble. Humble. Humble yourself and not... Not to the degree that we normally call humility, but to the degree that you are poorer than the working poor. You're welfare poor. You are, the church got to raise me an offering so I can eat poor. You are, I got to go find somebody, give me some money to help me make it poor. And that's why the Lord wants you in your opinion of your now, I know why this is a hard term to preach because it flies in the face of what is convention. See, because we live in a church age now where we're constantly building up ourselves, not on our holy faith, but on, in ourselves. I told, told you I was in a conversation with someone the other day and I explained to them what I meant by all these self-help books. These things are making us monsters. 
Jesus didn't, Jesus' advice wasn't to have all of the self-help manuals. Jesus said, if a man come after me, let him deny himself. None of those self-help books are going to teach you that. Because it's designed not to do that. It's to teach self-discovery. Self-love. Self-promotion. When those books are finished, you are God. And the only use that you have for the true and living God and for church is if God helps you do whatever it is you want to do and help you get to wherever it is you want to go. As long as God is doing that, then God is good and the church is good. But the moment God stops doing that and the church stops providing that, that you go looking for another church because you didn't get a word to address your situation. You need to get poor. Poor. Poverty of soul. Poverty of soul where we can say to the Lord I'm nothing where we can say to the Lord that, that takes some emptying out now oh 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 some of us can't stay married because you can't you can't bend too alive it's, it's too much about you you wouldn't move you wouldn't bend you wouldn't buy cost you your wife cost you your husband broke up your home well, what's the reason that God gave for divorce. What was the main reason? Hardness of heart. So in the beginning it was not so. Hardness of heart. Hardness of heart translated unwilling to bend. It's too much about me. Too much about me. Too much about you. Not enough about the Lord. So Jesus says as I teach this now I'm preaching the kingdom. He just started preaching the kingdom. Now he's getting ready to go into details. First thing he does is he tells you how to enter. Tells you what's necessary for you to get it. To get it in you in this life. He starts with, you've got to be poor of soul. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who allow me to chop down, down that image that they have erected of themselves to the point where they can come to the Lord by saying to God in my hands no price I bring but simply to the cross I claim who wants this Enough to get poorer. Poverty of soul. I'm too much alive, Lord. I'll admit it. I'll admit it. Lord, it was hard hearing the pastor use those terms because, Lord, I don't ever want to be uh, working poor. I don't want to be welfare poor. I don't want to be charity poor. Except... In this sense, I need it. For it will, if I let God make me this poor, it will prevent me from ever becoming that poor. Some of us, is, uh, everything is all, all about you. Unless the Lord is doing what you want him to do. Unless the church is going in the direction you think. Unless the, the job you know, provides everything you think it ought to provide. No workplace guarantees, listen, young workers, this is for the young workers. Uh, some, of you, some of you other, it's too late, and then some of the grown people already know. Workplaces, they don't guarantee you won't get your feelings hurt. See, that's not, that's not in the contract. That's not in it. There's no guarantee that they would do what you want them to do. That's not in the contract. What you are paid for is your time. Your talent and your energy. You might get chewed out and get your feelings hurt every day. Well, I'll leave. Well, go get another job. They're going to chew you out there. You know when your feelings won't be as easily hurt? 
when you get poor of soul. That's what the law is trying to do, trying to work out. That's, what some, that's why we're so sensitive. So easily hurt, get mad at the drop of a hat. Too rich. Too rich of self. Too rich. Everything. You weigh everything by how? By yourself. That's not God. This is hard to hear. I'm, I'm impressed with the altar. I didn't think but three people gonna come, so you're doing better, praise the Lord. Give yourselves a hand. I didn't think, I, you know, I didn't think that many people would come you know, for a sermon like this. I said, well, Lord, I, I preach hard Friday night, so. <laughs> but Lord, I want this. I, I want, I want this. I want this. Jesus says that it's gonna be difficult for a rich man to get to heaven, it's, it's much easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, people miss the point because they, 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 liken, they liken the animal, the animal going through the eye of a, a needle that you so close up with. Now, that can't be what he meant because if that's the case, that's impossible. A camel 900 pound beasts of burden cannot go through the eye of a sewing needle. In that case, all rich people are going to hell. That meant that Abraham went, Job went. And then when you look at how expensive Jesus' robe was, he went. Well, he did go, didn't he? But he didn't stay. <laughs> means that God contradicts himself. Why would you bless people if it's impossible for a blessed person to be saved? The needle's eye was the opening of the gate. The walls, in the Bible cities had walls. In the walls there were opening <laughs> called gates, eye of the needle. And the camel had to kneel down and crawl through the eye of the needle because the camel, uh, and he had to unload its burden in order to get through. You see, the camel loaded down, couldn't get through. It was designed to help those who did the manual label, labor of unburdening, unloading the camels. Are you with me? So in serving Jesus, you got to unload. See, you got to unload your baggage. Unload that extraordinarily high opinion that you have of yourself. Stop being a legend in your own mind. Unload. Unload. You got to say I'm not all of that and really mean it. Unload. Then you'll go in because let me tell you why this is important and I'm going to pray. I'm done. Extraordinary things happen to people when the kingdom of God is operating in their lives. Wonderful things happen. He takes an ordinary person and makes them extraordinary. He blesses you. He does all kinds of things. But if you're not humble enough to handle it, then that will mess you up. See, so he brings us down so that we can handle the places he raises us up to, the, the appointments he gives us, the jobs that he gives us, the things that we suffer, the things that we go through. When you're humble enough, you'll say, Lord, I'm honored that you allow this to happen. Be it good or bad, because I know you love me and that you're gonna see me through. It takes, it, takes, it takes being poor in your soul to get there. 